How did they oppose the message? By many ways. Out of them is they tried to convince Abu Talib and then uh, they tried to block the da'wah indirectly and then they had a showdown with Abu Talib. What else did they do in order to prevent the prophetic message from being uh, taught to others? Uh, the third thing that we'll mention is that they tried to ban the recitation of the Quran in public. They tried to make it that if the Quran were recited, they would drown it out with their voices or they would not even allow it to be recited. The fourth tactic was to ridicule the Prophet and the believers. Another tactic, the fifth tactic is false accusations, not just joking, but slander. The sixth point will mention, sometimes they tried to challenge the Prophet ﷺ for a miracle. The seventh tactic that they did was attempts of a middle ground or attempts of outright bribery directly. The Jews understood who is a Prophet. The Arabs did not know who is a or what is a Prophet. And therefore, when the Arabs heard of this, that you are a Prophet of God, the only other nation that they knew who believed in Prophets were the Jews and Christians. And so they sent emissaries to the Jews. They sent emissaries to the people of the book in order to say, okay, this is a phenomenon that is from your religion, it's happening in our culture. So why don't you tell us something that we can quiz the Prophet with? We can try to ask the Prophet Wasallam. And obviously, because they thought he was a false Prophet, he was not going to be able to answer. So his lies will be exposed. So this was another tactic that they tried and they failed in this tactic as well. The ninth tactic that they used is outright torture. Now, as we said over and over again, the Arabs of old were a tribal society. Everything was based upon tribalism and therefore your protection is based upon who will protect you, not the law, not the government, but rather your own tribe. And therefore those who had tribal bonds, like the Prophet ﷺ, like Abu Bakr, like others, they were somewhat protected, somewhat. However, as we know, many of the earliest converts were from the slaves and the Mawali. Sayyid ibn Jubayr asked Ibn Abbas, was the torture really that bad? So Ibn Abbas responded that the believers were tortured in early Islam so severely and they were starved and they were deprived of water until they could not even sit up out of pain. They would have to be almost semi-conscious on the ground. And until one of them would be told, is Allah and Al-Uzza your God? And they would respond, yes, Allah is my God. Yes, Al-Uzza is my God, just to get rid of the torture. In fact, Ibn Abbas says, so much so that if an insect passed by them and they would have been asked, is this insect your God? God, they would have responded, yes, it is my God, just to get rid of that torture. The main culprit behind all of this torture was none other than uh, Abu Jahl. Now the question arises, what happened with the Prophet himself? Did he undergo any physical torture? No doubt that the Quraysh overall and the Prophet as well were relatively protected. But this does not mean that nothing happened to them. This does not mean that they were completely immune. Rather, we have a number of incidents in which the Prophet was physically harmed. Uh, uh, eventually, of course, they talked about assassinating him and then they had multiple assassination attempts culminating in the grand assassination attempt that took place the night before the Hijrah. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His divine wisdom protected him. And sometimes for wisdom Allah knows he was not protected. There was a time when Abu Jahl, when Abu Jahl was boasting to his peers, to his colleagues in Quraysh. And Abu Jahl said to the people that I swear by Allah and Al-Uzza that if I see this this man again, one more time, the Prophet ﷺ, I am going to put my foot on his neck, meaning when he's in sajda, and I'm going to throw sand onto him. And the Prophet ﷺ came that day, Abu Huraira narrated, and he started praying. And when the Prophet ﷺ went into sajda, Abu Jahl came forward trying to or attempting to put his foot on the neck of the Prophet ﷺ. But before he got to him, the people around him saw that he turned backwards. He started walking backwards and he started pushing with his hands away and they couldn't see what was happening. And when he returned back, they said, what happened? What happened to your threat? Why did you walk away? We, we saw you putting your hand out. And so Abu Jahl said that I saw between me and him a pit of fire and there were wings hovering above that fire. When the Prophet ﷺ finished, he told the Muslims that this fire was brought by the angels. The wings were those of the angels. And had he taken one step closer, the angels would have shred him khiraqan khiraqa, to basically to bits and shreds. They would have shredded him into bits. It is also narrated, Urwa ibn Zubayr asked Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, tell me the worst thing that you saw happen to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. So Abdullah ibn Amr narrates what he saw. 
And he says, once the Prophet ﷺ was praying next to the Kaaba, when Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt came from behind him, and he took off his thawb, his garment, could have been like a type of uh, shawl, and he threw it around his neck, the Prophet ﷺ's neck, and began to choke him. Began to choke him. And the Prophet ﷺ was struggling with that choking, and the people did not intervene at all. Until finally Abu Bakr was told that your companion is being tortured. And so he rushed to the masjid and he began beating up from behind now because now he's the process of being choked from behind. And so he attacked Uqba and he said to him, rajulan an Rabbi Allah? Are you gonna kill a person just because he said he says my Lord is God? My Lord is Allah? And there are other examples of this nature where they physically uh, harmed him. Sometimes the harm was not physical but rather emotional. So Ibn Mas'ud said that once the Prophet ﷺ was praying again in front of the Kaaba when Abu Jahl and a group of his ilk of his peers were sitting around each other and the day before a camel had just been sacrificed so Abu Jahl said who amongst you will go to the carcass of that camel in the there is a dump area outside Mecca there's an area where you would throw your trash so who will go to the the carcass of that uh, camel and bring the entrail the intestine the the the, the guts that which nobody's gonna eat it's been thrown away Bring that and throw it on the back of the Prophet of Muhammad when he is praying to his Lord. And so the worst of them, Ibn Mas'ud says, the worst of them, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, the one that we just mentioned, he goes to a dead carcass and he puts his hand inside this filthy decomposing body and he carries with his own two hands entrails, blood, this, this disgusting uh, sticky substance. And he comes from that yard, from that uh, lot, and he walks all the way into the city. And the Prophet is still praying because as we know, the Prophet prayer was long. He waited for him to go into sajda. The Prophet is unaware of what's happening behind him. And when he fell into sajda, then Uqba came and he dumped all of the stomach and the entrails and the intestine, this big, it's a camel, it's not a trivial animal, you know? And he dumped it all onto the head of the Prophet while he is in sajda. And all of it fell onto him and the weight of it was so heavy that he could not lift himself up. Ibn Mas'ud said, The people began to laugh so hard that some of them had to fall onto their sides and others were hitting themselves. You know how they do when they laugh like this. And others were hitting themselves. And I was standing from a distance looking, but I had no way to help. I didn't have mun'a, meaning there was nobody that would have supported me. I am Ibn Mas'ud, these are Abu Jahl and whatnot. And the Prophet ﷺ remained sajid, remained in sajda until some persons went to tell Fatima, who at this time was probably around eight, nine years old, went to tell Fatima that your father needs your help. And so Fatima was a Juwaidiyah, was a little girl, Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud is saying. She was a little girl at the time and she began crying and running towards the Prophet ﷺ and helped him get this dead animal off of his back and the Prophet ﷺ then stood up, he managed to stand up and he turned and he faced them. And he raised his finger up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when they saw him in this fashion, they became quiet. And he began making dua against them by name. Allahumma alayka bi Abi Jahl. Allahumma alayka bi Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Allahumma alayka bi... And he mentioned every single one of them. And he mentioned each of them three times until all of them had a deadly pale in their faces, the blood drained from their face. And then Ibn Mas'ud said, So I swear by the one who sent Muhammad with the truth that I myself saw every one of these seven dead in the battle of Badr. The first engagement, Allah took care of all of them. And eventually, of course, the matters got worse than this and talk began of uh, assassination. It is narrated in Ibn, Ibn Is Ishaq that once the news spread that they had planned to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. And a, a neighbor told Fatima, that a, a lady neighbor told Fatima that, you know, they're talking about assassinating your father. And Fatima ran home and told the Prophet ﷺ that they're planning to assassinate you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, fear not, Allah Azza wa will take care of me. Bring me water. And so she brought him water. He did wudu, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he walked into the masjid. And they had their arms and they were ready to kill him. But not one of them could move. They all became paralyzed. They could not stand up. And the Prophet sallallahu took some sand and threw it at their faces while they're standing, while they're sitting and looking at him. And they were completely paralyzed. And he said, Shahatil wujuh. May these faces be uh, cursed. And in this riwayah as well, the Sahabi says, every one of these were of those who were killed in the battle of Badr.
Uh, the last tactic that they did is the tactic of the boycott. And the boycott is its own topic that we're going to talk about. When the Sahaba reached around, we don't know an exact number, but roughly a ballpark, figure around 20 or 30 of the Sahaba were present. The Prophet realized that he needed a place to congregate. Because there was, they couldn't do so in Mecca, in the, in the Kaaba, because it was too public. A lot of Muslims were secret Muslims. So the Prophet decided to choose the house of, as you all know, Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. And so Darul Arqam became the place where the Sahaba would meet. When did this happen? We don't have any year, but probably around, we would estimate around the, the middle of the third or the beginning of the fourth year. In other words, as soon as the Da'wah went public, within a few months after that. Remember the Da'wah went public after three years, right? After three years, when the Da'wah becomes public, all of this persecution begins, the Prophet needs a place, so he chooses the house of Al-Arqam.